Hello and welcome to a video summarising everything you need to know about the novella of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. Now, this video will go over everything you need to understand when it comes to the plot of this novella, but also what we'll begin by doing is looking at context and important contextual factors that influence John Steinbeck when writing this. We'll then examine the key characters and what you need to understand with all of the characters in this novella, and then we'll end by looking at themes. So let's begin. Now, when it comes to understanding the novella as a whole, let's first look at what essentially happens throughout this story. Now, do bear in mind that this story takes place over four days, starting essentially on Thursday evening and ending on Sunday. Now, the story features two displaced migrant workers called George Milton and Lenny Small, so George and Lenny, and they move from place to place in California in search of work opportunities in the 1930s. Now, in the story, they find work on a ranch in a place called Soledad, and in Spanish, this means solitude. Now, when they begin to work on the ranch, both George and Lenny meet other characters who emphasise the sense of loneliness and difficulty that accompanies life for migrant workers on a ranch, especially in 1930s America. Now, we learn that George is a small, intelligent man who looks after his friend who's much larger. However, Lenny has a learning disability. Now, Lenny's strength does become increasingly problematic. In fact, we do realise even from the opening of the story that they had to leave the previous work on another ranch as a result of Lenny's own uncontrollable strength. And this strength becomes increasingly problematic in this new ranch and it becomes clear that he does not understand how much damage that he can cause. Now, George and Lenny meet many notable characters on the ranch. This includes the ranch owner, his conniving son Curly, his lustful and lascivious wife, known as Curly's wife. But also, George and Lenny meet the most respected and revered ranch worker called Slim. Other notable characters in this story include Candy, the elderly ranch worker, Crooks, the only African-American worker who lives separately from the men, and Carlson, who kills Candy's old but loyal dog. And at several points in this story, George and Lenny discuss their dream of owning their own ranch and working for themselves, but this is shown to be an impossibility, and things do come to a head at this end of the story, when Lenny accidentally kills Curly's wife, and George's only option is to shoot him before he's caught, and this therefore, of course, means he kills kills any hope that they both had of achieving their dream. Now, when we're looking at this story, it's really important, especially when you are writing about this story, either for your course or exams, to understand the contextual factors that Steinbeck was influenced by, and of course, even what he wants to illustrate through all of these key characters in the story. Now, of course, do bear in mind that this story was set in the 1930s America, and this was at the height of the Great Depression. Bear in mind that the Great Depression started, historically speaking, in 1929 as a result of the crash of Wall Street, which is basically America's financial district. Now, due to that crash and obviously the resultant economic depression, there was a Great Depression where lots of people lost jobs, uh, a lot of jobs also, and employment was in very short supply. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that Steinbeck was born in Salinas in California and this is a state where agriculture was the leading industry and of course the state was also highly affected by the Great Depression. Now conflict arose in Salinas in the early decades of the 20th century over the squeezing out of small family farms by large-scale commercial growers who employed cheap seasonal workers. Now, community structures deteriorated in where Steinberg was born and labour practices became really harsh and unfair. And of course, this is also even reflected in how George, Lenny and the ranch workers are treated. Now, in Salinas during Steinbeck's time, the civic instability destroyed the ideal of a good society, which was shared democratically by all citizens. Now, also bear in mind, one of the things that Steinbeck really, really found influential in his writing is as a result of him working on sugar ranches himself in the 1920s, this is of course before the 1930s depression, his experience on ranches and interacting with different labourers is one of the things that really gave him inspiration for the list of characters that he has written in Mice and Men. Now, of course, the novella itself was completed in 1937 during the Great Depression, which is a time of conflict between the American dream of capitalist land ownership and the unsteady economy. As I mentioned before, the Great Depression was triggered by the collapse of Wall Street in 1929. And of course, this also collapsed a lot of people's dreams of attaining land ownership and achieving the American dream. 
Now, in the story, Steinbeck does portray the social alienation of migrants like George and Lenny, and he dramatizes the struggle of working people who are striving to become independent landowners. By the late 1930s, as a result of the Great Depression, job security had reached its lowest ebb. So there were mechanical combines, which enabled, for example, five men to do the work of 300 people. And this produced over half of the nation's grain harvest in 1938. Now, this is the situation that's depicted in the novella, a social climate of irregular work for migrant workers, low wages, squalid living conditions reflected in the ranch, and also emotional depression deprivation shown through just how lonely a lot of ranch workers really are. Now, do bear in mind that when you're discussing Of My Men in this context, remember that what this story is showing is this unhappy fraternity of would-be pioneers. So you've got the burly buck, buckers, the buckhouse hand, the mule skinner, the seasonal drifters, and of course the lonely woman who's embodied in Curly's wife. And all of these people and all of these different characters on the ranch conflict with the ranch owner, his son, and the existing social structure. So do bear in mind that in this story, we witness two types of struggle. The first being the private local struggle of the California Valley. So two drifters trying to escape a cycle of depression by saving up for a small farm of their own. But the second struggle is the tragic public struggle of all places and times where men were challenged to discover and maintain their humanity in the face of really difficult, overwhelming forces characterized by the Great Depression. Now, the second contextual factor to bear in mind, which influenced Steinbeck, is the Dust Bowl. Now, the Dust Bowl, which is also known as the Dirty Thirties, was a period of severe dust storms that caused major ecological and agricultural damage to American and Canadian prairie lands in the 1930s. Now, the phenomenon of the Dust Bowl was caused by severe drought, combined with the failure by many farmers to apply dry land farming methods to prevent wind erosion. So extensive deep ploughing of the virgin topsoil of the Great Plains in the preceding decades, so in the 1920s, had displaced a lot of the natural deep-rooted grass that normally kept the soil in place and trapped moisture even during periods of drought and high winds. Now, during the drought of the 1930s, because there were no natural anchors to keep the soil in place, a lot of the topsoil in these prairies dried, they turned into dust and they blew away with the winds, causing this infamous dust bowl. And at times, the clouds in the sky became really, really black, reaching all the way to the East Coast cities like New York, Washington, D.C. And this is from the agricultural lands in the Midwest and the South, which is a huge kind of area to cover. Now, these immense dust storms, which were given names like black blizzards, black rollers, often reduced visibility to just a few feet or less. And the drought and erosion of the Dust Bowl affected 100 million acres. And it was centered on the panhandles of Texas, Oklahoma, and nearby sections of New Mexico, Colorado, and Kansas. Now, hundreds of thousands of people, as a result of this, as a result of the Dust Bowl, were forced to leave their farms. Many of these families, who are known as Okies, and because many came from Oklahoma, had to leave and migrate to places like California, where they found economic conditions really difficult. And and this was even made worse because of the Great Depression. Okay, so Steinbeck really is using this context to illustrate, and especially in this story, just how grueling, challenging, and often unrewarding life was for migrants farmers and just as George and Lee had a dream of having a better life on their own farm the great plains farmers who lived near the dust bowl and in the dust bowl dreamed of finding a better life in California when they had to leave their homes but of course they never did the other important contextual factor that influenced Steinbeck and especially it influenced how he characterized and described Lenny's or rather Curly's wife is Hollywood Now, the 1920s and 30s were a key era and a key period for cinema in America and the growth of the Hollywood film industry. And this machine was dominated at this time by big studios, including Universal, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Paramount Films. Now, the films that they produced were a form of escapism during the aftermath of the Depression, reinstating the mythical American values of individualism, classlessness and progress. And it's easy to see how vulnerable, isolated women like Curly's wife might have seen in Hollywood's promises and the industry that made them the chance for a different existence. 
Now, one thing to remember with Hollywood is central to its success is the archetypal leading man and of course the leading lady. However, despite the promising fame and stardom, Hollywood had the capacity, which was really well known, to chew up and spit out a conveyor belt of actors and actresses chosen for the similarities to this conforming and very narrow ideal of physical appearance, such as being a beautiful leading man or beautiful leading lady. Now, female stars of the silver screen were idolized across America. For example, you only need to think of, for example, how Marilyn Monroe was idolized. However, they also did conversely set standards of beauty that were essentially unattainable to ordinary women. And it's those glamorous looks that Curly's wife is really desperate to believe that she has. Also, these Hollywood ladies did play femme fatales, and this is French for deadly women, and they were seen and depicted in Hollywood as seductresses, they were demonised and also feared for their allure. Of course, again, if you think about how Curly's wife is demonised, she's really characterised in the story as a femme fatale with other ranch workers. Now, remember that the femme fatale is inherently bound up with promiscuity and the rejection of motherhood and Curly's wife's actions in the barn just before her death can be seen in this way as she encourages stroking from Lenny which is obviously a sexualized action which triggers a response from Lenny where he confuses sexuality with maternity and this leads to his bewildered panic which leads him to smother and kill her. Now, another really important contextual factor to bear in mind is America in the 1930s was a period also influenced by Jim Crow laws. Now, this, of course, applies to the character of crooks. Now, do bear in mind that the Jim Crow laws were basically state and local laws that enforced during this period racial segregation, which just means separation between black and white people in America. And these laws were essentially enacted from the 1890s and they stayed in force until around 1965. So what these laws did was it led to many African-Americans facing a number of economic, educational and social disadvantages. And these laws generally caused things like housing segregation. So, for example, a lot of African-Americans tended to live in clusters of poorer ghettos. Bank lending prejudice, so for example, getting loan and money from the bank was really difficult if you were African-American, and also job discrimination, especially white-collar jobs, so really respected jobs, which obviously all of this kind of combined and led to a lot of African-American people finding themselves very, very disadvantaged, very poor, and very separated from mainstream society. And of course, this is even shown through Crooks' character. He lives in a completely separate area to the other ranch house workers. Now, bear in mind that the Jim Crow laws led to segregated public schools, for instance, segregated public places, separated public transportation, and even the segregation of things like restrooms, restaurants, and drinking fountains for whites and blacks. And the US military was even segregated, as were government workplaces and facilities for African Americans. So basically, the things that they could use and they were allowed to use were consistently inferior and underfunded when compared to what was available to European Americans, the white Americans, and sometimes even some of these facilities didn't exist at all. So Jim Crow laws eventually were overruled by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, all of these contextual factors really influenced how Steinbeck formulated and created all the main characters in this story. Now, of course, the first major character is George. And do bear in mind that his name, Sir George, means husbandman. And this is a person who cultivates the land. Now, George is associated in this story with commitment and brotherly love, especially towards Lenny. And he's quite self-sacrificial. He gives up much that would make his own life fulfilling in order to have companionship with Lenny. Also, we find that when they do arrive on the ranch, so both George and Lenny, George is really admired by Slim, Candy and Crooks. And he's really depicted by Steinbeck as being a careful decision maker. He also is very good at managing Lenny's natural resource of strength. George also learns responsibility in the final scene when he decides to kill Lenny in order to protect him from lynching, which is based on the paradox of being cruel to be kind. Now, the second important character is Lenny. So his name, the full version being Leonard, means as strong as a lion. So whilst he's very strong, he's also blessed with childish guile. Now, Lenny is actually a figure taken from Steinbeck's 
own experience. Now, this is Steinbeck's own words. He says, Lenny was a real person. He's in, an, he's in an insane asylum in California. He killed a ranch foreman, got sore as the boss had fired his pal and struck a pitchfork right through his stomach. So do bear in mind that the character of Lenny is actually based on somebody that Steinbeck himself had met. Now, Lenny stands as a symbol of humankind's animal nature, yet he's also a primitive who responds by instinct and whose mind has really never learned how to control his body. However, Lenny is also depicted as a victim and a symbol of a world that's rarely fair, tolerant or understanding towards weaker people like him. Moreover, Lenny is really, really powerful in terms of his strength, his physical might. However, he's really, really powerless without the leadership of George to direct this power. Now, bear in mind that the mouse, for instance, the mouse that he has in his pocket, this is a novel symbol for his own inevitable doom. So Lenny carries his own destiny, the mouse, in his own pocket. Now, the other character is that of Slim. So Slim is a mule driver and he's a permanent employee of the ranch. So he represents kind of employees and how they were treated, especially the strong employees before mechanization, mule drivers who were at the top of the social tree and they earned lots of good money on ranches. Now, Slim epitomizes fairness, sound judgment and dignified acceptance, and he's really respected on the ranch by his peers and superiors. He also accepts and sanctions uh, George and Lenny within the bunkhouse community, and he's really depicted by Steinbeck as being the conscience of the novel and the voice of truth. He also is one of the characters that understands that George probably did kill Lenny, but he didn't kill Lenny out of self-defense. He killed him perhaps maybe because he was protecting him. And at the close of the novel, Slim does abdicate the power that he has being at the top of the ranch house hierarchy. Now, in contrast to Slim is Curly's character. So he's the boss's son and he's really depicted as being a very hyper-masculine symbol of the angry young, young generation of the 1930s. For, in, for example, he's an ex-lightweight boxer. Also, Curly is depicted as very insecure. He has a grudge against bigger, taller men than him. He almost has a Napoleonic complex. Curly is also ostracized from the ranch community because he represents white collar power. Bear in mind that he is the boss's son, but he's also in a weird position but he, because he's not the boss in his own right. However, he also realizes that he can't really garner the respect that he wishes. Moreover, Curly is rendered a laughing stock because of the actions of his own flirtatious wife. And so his short stature, as well as a glove full of Vaseline, just makes him a caricature to the other men. Moreover, Curly has an inability to create a meaningful relationship with his wife, which renders him part responsible for her death. Because he can't create a meaningful relationship with her, she seeks intimacy, she seeks connection with other men. And of course, it's this kind of seeking for connection with Lenny that ultimately kills her. So he is indirectly responsible for her death. Now, of course, this leads to Curly's wife being the other important character. Now, she's the only woman on the ranch and she marries Curly, not due to love, we discover, but actually due to the limited choices that she faced as a woman in 1930s America. Now, Curly's wife is filled with adolescent rage at missing out at what she felt was a chance of a Hollywood career. And her escape route was seen as the Hollywood dream by her. However, her namelessness, even the fact that we don't know her name, she's just known simply as Curly's wife, is an ironic indicator that in spite of this Hollywood dream that she has, she will never be famous. Moreover, in the story, she's presented consistently as a sexual commodity and her overt sexuality is actually the opposite. It's an inversion of George's puritanical nature. That's why George never trusts her. Also, like Crooks, she is starved of companionship and she's starved of acceptance and she stays consistently as an outsider. Moreover, bear in mind that Curly's wife, from a biblical perspective, fulfills the role of Eve in the Genesis story. She's a temptress, she's a femme fatale, the destroyer of paradise, the one who shatters the dream that George and Lenny have of attaining this American dream. Of course, the other isolated character is the only African-American man who's also disabled on the ranch, and this is Crooks. So he carries a double burden. Firstly, he's black, 
but also he's partially disabled. That's why he's called crooks because his back is crooked, bent. And he's he has this double burden in a society that's prejudiced against both. So Crooks really becomes this paradoxical figure that's conditioned by an environment of brokenness, cynicism, disillusionment, low self-esteem, and he also has a diminished status. Arguably, he probably occupies the lowest status on the ranch house community. Also, Crooks's response to how he's treated by other men is one almost of intellectualized fortitude and resilience, and he's part spokesman for Steinbeck. Moreover, symbolic objects in his place where he's staying characterize his world. For example, broken harnesses, split collars, medicine bottles, a tattered dictionary, a mauled civil code. All of these show his world and his brokenness. Of course, the other character is Candy. So he's a disabled swamper and he's used as a scapegoat for the brutality of the ranch house community. Now, Candy is a sentimentalized figure by Steinbeck, and he's the object of reader sympathy. He offers George his life savings as a way to try and attain this American dream that both George and Lenny are striving for. He tries to secure a farm partnership and attain this American dream. Also, Candy is inescapably linked to his uselessness with his old dog. So both Candy and his old dog, who've given all their lives to the ranch, now are portrayed as helpless, maltreated, and ultimately cast aside. And of course, the dog is killed. Maybe this foreshadows Candy's eventual death. Also, Candy is arguably responsible for the scene of the greatest pathos, sadness in the novel, when he looks for help from face to face once a death sentence of his dog is pronounced. So this is arguably one of the greatest, saddest scenes in this novella. Now, the other character to bear in mind is that of Carlson. So do bear in mind that Carlson, in contrast to these other characters, he stands as the embodiment of the detached migrant worker. For example, he pressurizes Candy into having his dog shot and he carries out this killing himself with evident capability. Also, Carlson has no problem with destruction and the unintentional cruelty that's part of this identity on the migrant farm. He also owns the Luger pistol that George later uses to kill Lenny. And Carlson essentially represents the force of destruction that's key to modern capitalist USA. Now, in terms of themes that Steinbeck explores in this novella, the first, of course, is the American dream. So the title of Mice and Men actually comes from a poem called To a Mouse by the 18th century Scottish poet Robert Burns. Now, in this poem, Burns uh, writes after unintentionally plying up the nest of a mouse that, and to quote from the poem, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang off to a galley, in other words, often go awry, and leave us naught, leave us nothing, but grief and pain for promised joy, okay? So the title of this novel of Mice and Men is actually taken from this poem by Robert Burns. So this title then is not only a reference to the poor mice that Lenny accidentally kills, but to everyone whose dreams are destroyed. And the mention of mice also suggests something small and feeble, pitted against something so overwhelmingly strong in the shape of fate and destiny. Now, bear in mind that the American dream arose from how America was first populated. So this idea and this notion of the American dream came from how it was even established. Its people came from almost every country and background from around the world. However, they were united by belief that America would give up opportunities denied to them in their home country in the old world. Now, American history reveals that some, the people who migrated to America, did strike it rich in the USA, but many more, far more, lost their lives and savings in this futile quest to attain the American dream. So this novella of Mice and Men approaches this theme by showing that the American dream is still an impossible mission and an untenable fantasy for many. Now, if we think about the American dream as symbolized by this ranch that George and Lenny want to have, This coalition that they form, so George, Lenny and ultimately Candy who comes in, this represents the American dream in its most fundamental state, capitalism in its purest form, because firstly, it shows this desire that George, Lenny and Candy have to work for themselves and not for others. Secondly, it obviously shows a desire for material wealth and spiritual fulfillment. And thirdly, there's this desire centered on work, profit and independence. 
Now, the Californian coastal valley where the action takes place in the story is the real setting. So it's a small, confined, quasi-primitive place and it's a dream farm. And it's kind of recited by Lenny almost in, as this religious garden of Eden. Now, even before the story begins, the description of the valley grove in chapter one suggests symbolically that paradise might actually already be spoiled. This Eden that George and Lenny strive to own might actually still be tainted already. Okay, so for example, this is illustrated when Lenny gulps the water from the narrow port at the beginning in the first chapter and George warns him, I ain't sure that's good water. So if the land itself is poisoned from the start, if it's a poison chalice, then the idea of living off the fat of the land is similarly a poisoned fantasy. So even from the start, Steinbeck is showing this unattainability of this American dream. Now, many people who've read this and critics really see George's relationship with Lenny in contrasting ways. So, for example, when it comes to attaining the American dream, George is a radical leader. He attempts to lead Lenny, a symbol of the masses, to a utopia, to owning this farm. Lenny, because he's too strong and untrustworthy, however, fails George, hence the utopia fails. The masses fail the leader. However, another way to see it is that George is just simply a worker trying to improve his lot in life by becoming a landowner and this foolhardy ambition collapses and the vessel of destruction which is then he's killed off and George basically at the end of the story just ends up forming a new alliance with Slim, the adjusted worker who functions successfully within his class and accepts that the American dream is something that's unattainable. So there's two ways to really see the American dream and how it's depicted in this story. Now, another final way to see it, so this is from a psychoanalytical perspective, from a psychology perspective, if you see it in terms of the um, lens of a key psychologist called Carl Jung, Lenny could be considered as George's shadow self. So Lenny shadows his guardian figure, he imitates his actions in response to George's manipulation. However, the antagonistic aggressive forces within George's psychological framework are repressed and instead he projects this onto Lenny, using Lenny as a scapegoat for his own fault. And this is George's fault that they are late for arriving at the ranch, but blame is assigned to the shadow self, which is Lenny. Okay, so that's another way to interpret this. Now, in this interpretation, in this psychology interpretation, Lenny's death stands for more than just simply a mercy killing because Lenny is the embodiment of George's projected frustrations. The killing of Lenny is also a symbolic eradication of those qualities in himself that George despises and it's a form of personal release. Now, the other important theme is this Darwinian idea of the survival of the fittest. Now, Steinbeck's principal aim is to show in this story that without the civilizing forces of companionship, we become almost like animals, feeding off others and spurning the weak, which is Charles Darwin's own concept of the survival of the fittest. And this partly explains the preponderance of animal imagery and symbolism in the text. So the story appears to be almost like a realist fable, where the weak animals die, rather than a traditional one in which humility generally gets the better of pride. And Steinbeck implicitly criticizes his capitalist society and the American dream culture, which cares little for society's weakest members. Now, Steinbeck's point is exemplified in the way that characters represent varying forms of prejudice. So there's physical disability, which is represented through candy, gender, so which, uh, you know, women face a lot of prejudice, shown in Kelly's wife, racial prejudice shown in crooks, and mental disability prejudice shown in Lenny, and of course, social class, which is emphasized through how Curly occupies a higher social status than the other men. So the story of My Cement is a story of the human potential to rise above the animal level to a finer spirit. However, this novella shows the power of a society formed by nature's lower forces and the power that this has to destroy this finer, fragile human aspiration. Now, if you look at Lenny, he's a large, simple-minded and clumsy character whose physical appearance is most like an animal. And he's first described as looking like a bear with big paws, walking heavily. Now, Lenny's fawning approach to crooks in the doorway of the black man's quarter is almost again like that of a shy dog who desperately wants to make friends with a hostile man. And at the end of the story, when George puts the gun behind his head to kill him, Lenny is identified with Candy's old dog who's early been killed in a similar fashion. Now, in this story, those who display the basis elements of nature are Curly and Carlson, who lack 
all sensitivity for those more helpless and weaker than they are. So Carlshen shows his animalistic nature by pushing Candy into allowing him to shoot his beloved old dog, whilst Curly is the epitome of man's lower nature. So Curly is driven to compete constantly. It's as if he lives in a world where the physically fit must survive. And as with the lower order animals, they must act only for self-gratification. So for example, he joins a ranch hands in visiting a brothel in the nearest town, even though he's recently married. Now, Candy, Curly's wife, and even for a brief moment, Crooks, all also show a need to dream, which in this novel symbolizes reaching for something above one's brute nature, okay? Yet it's George and Lenny who best embody the finer spirit that aspires and sustains human connections. And it's been said that Lenny's obsession with mice and rabbits represents his yearning for human warmth. And of all characters in this story, only George and Lenny have a human bond that could be classified as being in the spirit of the family. Now, both Lenny and George travel together. They have a history, they have responsibility and a commitment to each other, and they need each other. And in the first scene, before they reach the ranch, George and Lenny reassure each other of their situation. So they say, we've got somebody to talk to that gives a damn about us. However, Candy, the old swamper, hopes to become part of this family. And we see their rise above animal nature, which is consistent with their rise about above ego. Uh, gratification and they try their best to soar above mere self for somebody else and indeed concern for the shared future rather than animalistic survival from one day to the next is illustrated okay so that's really it when it comes to understanding this story when it comes to understanding the plot in a nutshell the key characters but also important elements to understand when it comes to contextual factors as well as themes do bear in mind that we do have an ultimate English GCSE course that goes into lots and lots of depth when it comes to memorizing and remembering this and indeed other plays and novels that you're studying for English literature, but also how to pass your English language exam. So do make sure you check out the link in this description box and sign up for this course. Thank you so much for listening.